<laughs> so, 1670, 17th century, we've got monks dreaming about flying boats carried by vacuums. Right. So this is before the Revolutionary War. Yes. Okay. So just 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 picture that, and you've got people already picturing vacuum balloons. Yes. Over a hundred years later, two brothers figure out how to actually make it work. The Montgolfier brothers. They make a balloon out of sackcloth and paper. So this tells you the level of technology that we are operating at. It's sackcloth and paper, and it's just smeared with stuff. And they put hot air in it, and it takes off. And they go and tell the king about it, King Louis the Sixteenth of France. He offers them two, two convicts <laughs> to send up in the balloon. <laughs> Didn't they end up with a sheep or something? Yes. Okay. Uh, instead of the convicts, because the Montgolfier brothers were not monsters, uh, <laughs> they decided to send up a sheep, a duck, and a rooster. Was that just, like, what animals they had close nearby? I guess so. Why would they pick animals that can already fly? (laughs) Except for the sheep. (laughs) (laughs) Cody, (laughs) what's going on out in Nevada? You got a lot of flying sheep out there, do you? You do have interesting experiments going on. (laughs) I've seen them go over cliffs. (laughs) It's not pretty. Well... A lot of things fly in that case. (laughs) So, they take and send up, uh, send up these, 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 uh, animals. And the king is very impressed, the court is impressed, and it sets off this balloon mania all over the world that sucks everyone in, including George Washington. Everyone in the world is super excited about lighter than air travel, about finally being able to fly. It is a reality, right? And they, they attempt all of these incredible stunts to to fly balloons to far off places, and they start doing balloon races, uh, which weren't really, you know, who gets there first, but who can go the very farthest in a balloon before it comes back down. And all over the world, everyone is very, very excited about... Man finally being able to fly until they realize there is no way to steer a balloon. At right, the mercy of the winds. You can't. You can't really put out sails that make any kind of sense. A rudder is mostly useless. It's kind of rowing cool, is useless. When you're on a balloon, there's no wind. Like, it's not windy at all, because you're moving with the wind. I had not thought of that either. That's... Like, if you're sitting on a hot hmm. air balloon, you could actually have a birthday cake with candles, and they will they might flicker a little bit, because it's oh, differential, wow. but they just... <laughs> well, now I want my next birthday on a hot air balloon, clearly. <laughs> I know, that's one of my goals, too. <laughs> that is really cool. But it is also really scary, because what they quickly discovered was... That if you go up in a balloon and the line tying you to the ground snaps, or if you intentionally cut it loose, which a lot of people did, where you end up is anybody's guess. So you had all of these (laughs) really great adventure stories of people, like, drifting out into the wilds and, like, being rescued by Indians and becoming an honorary member of the tribe before hiking their way back to civilization. (laughs) Some of these stories really did happen, and they were amazing, and everybody wanted to have that experience, but most people ended up falling to their drowning. Uh, well, uh, did you get to be a god? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Turns out if you pick a random spot on the globe, you're probably going to drown in the ocean. Yes. Uh, that's going to be a common theme uh, that comes out throughout talking about airships. Uh, well, and uh, talking about aerostats, talking about lighter than air travel, a lot of people drown <laughs> because because they try to stay over water so that if they do crash land, that there's something relatively soft underneath. But then oh, the issue then is the that, uh, oh. yeah, you don't know where you're going to land or how far away from land that might be. You're trying to carry as little as possible, so generally the gear that they had with them was 
minimal. So a whole bunch of people start dying and balloons quickly go out of fashion. So they have to wait until they figure out how to make them drivable. Or in French, dirigible. Or how we said, dirigible. Dirigible. There it is. <laughs> That's where that comes from. Yes. Yeah. Dirigible literally means steerable. Right? Th- these were that. the steerables because all of a sudden, for the first time, you could actually take off from a place and land at the same place, which for them was just <laughs> mind blowing <laughs> stuff where you had this, you know. Uh, geography roulette that would happen if you just took off in a balloon. Uh, so they started trying some things. For starters, they got rid of the the round balloons because they were especially bad about just being picked up by the wind and they're off and away and nobody ever sees them again. They switched to the to the elongated cigar shaped balloons and they start trying to put an engine in it because. The best way to get to where you want to go is to be able to just push yourself using a great big fan or a propeller. But at this point, we're still dealing... I mean, at at the point that I've told you in the story, we're still dealing with with steam engines. Yes. Which are (laughs) huge and heavy. (laughs) They tried. They failed. It was sad. Because what they discovered as well was that once you get up into the air... The wind goes faster and faster the higher you go. Usually, yeah. Yeah. So they had this issue of working, just just using manpower to do it. You couldn't overcome the wind. Even on a, on a very calm day, you get up a ways and just the, just the, the, what would have been passing breezes on the ground are enough to take you completely off course. They start trying to put on steam engines, and you have the issue of you put on this giant steam engine, and so you have to have a giant balloon, and now that giant balloon is acting as a giant sail that is dragging dragging you with the wind more than this more than the engine can handle. And so that brings us up to the late 1800s. People have been trying to figure out dirigibles for any meaningful application for a hundred years ish when enters the scene a a particular determined career (laughs) soldier that i'll let lance tell you about excellent so yes who we are talking about and I, i took the time to find the exact name uh, because it's usually shortened, we are talking about Count Ferdinand Adolf Heinrich August Graf von Zeppelin. Yeah, I'm shortening that to Fred. <laughs> Heck yeah. <laughs> yes. Or Fred for short. Fred to his friends. Uh, and so he creates the vast Fred airship line. Uh, no. Uh, <laughs> and once again, we have an odd tie-in to America. He was there as a military observer during the American Civil War. Yes. Right? This is kind of where it gets started is because during the Civil War, we were already using hot air balloons as scouts. Right? You just get a hot air balloon. You, you know, reel them up on a rope. They say, oh, look, the Confederates are right there. Reel me back down in a hurry, please. (laughs) Right? Uh Oh, Cedric in the chat says Fred Zeppelin. That's exactly what we came up with before the show. <laughs> yes, this was Fred Zeppelin. Uh, and yes, very successful militarily, but then makes the mistake of criticizing the military leadership. And so he is forced into retirement. Uh, it's still an honorable retirement, right? They let him keep his title and uh, he gets a fair pension. But he's now out, and this is a very patriotic man, right? He wants Germany to rise and to conquer, probably not realizing just how that would go in the future. But for him, that is still the future. And it bugs him. So he's seen this. He's actually taken a ride in a hot air balloon. Loved it. That was fun. And most of all, remember who it was that was making these 
I don't know how you said it in French, dirigibles, right? It was the French. Yes. Right? This is like the arch enemy of Germany are the French, and they're getting up there. We need to get up there. Okay? And this is where I say Zeppelin was a bit like Cody. Okay? <laughs> he wasn't necessarily a trained engineer or even scientist he was a soldier but he had this will uh to win and to create and he starts out not with little simple experiments he starts out full scale already starts with this giant zeppelin thing which like i said i could absolutely see you doing cody I, it's on my list <laughs> <laughs> I, this is not my surprised face he uh, also for those that don't know me. He also had this this habit. Uh, he would work up a design. He would take it to a to a group of people to look at. So like the war ministry or like a, a group of engineers or a, or a or a or a scientific meeting and he would take it to them and they would say this is not feasible. And he would just take it back and take it to a different group <laughs> until someone said, oh, yeah, this could work. And they would say, I, I told you so. <laughs> I told them all. Uh, and that's that's how he did. No. Through, through failure after failure after failure, he just kept going until he found more compliant experts. Yes, he, he actually started with an actual scientist. I think the guy's name was Gross. Uh, and yeah, when the guy started to come back with this isn't going to work. Zeppelin fired him. <laughs> he was like, he, <laughs> what, what did he say? He said he was an obstacle to my progress or something like that. Uh, sounds like something he would say. Uh, <laughs> which, uh, anyways. And Zeppelin is a perfect example of someone failing forward. Because all these ships that he makes, they fail. Uh, they get picked up by a windstorm and destroyed or they catch on fire and all these things just get destroyed. He has to pull more and more uh, from public funding, always trying to get something that's uh, viable for the military, specifically. Uh, and finally, he gets one that stays in the air a whole... Let's see, the French had done three hours, mm -hmm. right? And he put a balloon up that stayed up there for 12 whole hours. Right, just hung up there, and this all of a sudden sparks off another German uh, fervor of excitement over this thing. But the military says, "You need to show us a flight where you stay in the air 24 hours." Right? They double his best time and say, "You need to show us that before we will place a single order." He tries, has engine trouble, sets down in a place, but you know, still, you know, still elevates, so it's still working. Uh, while he is inside eating dinner, a storm comes, picks the thing up, slams it on the ground, and it burns. And that, honestly, it was, it was like one of his greatest failures. And yet, this unites the people of Germany behind him. And in one of the largest scale crowdfunding, this was people. Right? All of a sudden, you know, school children are sending him money and <laughs> workers and everything. And all of a sudden, he gets some like four million marks to build this thing. And all of a sudden, lot? he's flush. It was at the time. <laughs> Holy smokes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, so he, yeah, he essentially loses his military contract, loses everything. And like I said, the guy just keeps succeeding with every failure and it wasn't <laughs> just money either it was uh one guy sent to him and said hey i've got huge amounts of this new exciting metal aluminum that i would like to gift to your program uh another uh you know two guys that he ended up meeting up with actually pretty early on in the process but they were all excited to work with him because they had this new gasoline burning engine that they wanted to Ooh. to get on board with with zeppelin and maybe we can put our new 
gas burning engines, uh, experimental gas burning engines on airships. Maybe Heck that's yeah. an exciting path forward for this new invention. He keeps just by virtue of being in the public eye, he keeps getting new supporters and new avenues of 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 progress just kind of by being very famous <laughs> by being and famous, by yeah. being <laughs> very determined. I hesitate to call him charismatic because by all oh. accounts he was awful to be in a room with for any length of time <laughs> he was this very abrasive uh individual but he was very determined and people gravitated to that yes so he kind of won over the german people and then the kaiser when he saw that the people were on board said okay we need some of these for the military now to be clear they still had not actually made this thing work Right? They still didn't have any success, but you had such this public groundswell of support uh, that the Kaiser was like, yep, we, we, we need Zeppelins, dang it. And so, and then of course, we're on our way up. Uh, they actually start some passenger runs between wealthy German cities, right? Essentially doing joy rides for the, the elite. Most of those crash. Yeah. Uh, but no fatalities. Zero. Right? So he's still yeah. failing, but nobody died. Right? So... Yeah, it's worth noting that this is... That at the same time, there is this technological arms race going on between aerostatic flight and aerodynamic flight. Airships and airplanes. Uh, Zeppelin has his first, first flight in 1900 right the wright brothers have their first flight in 1903 and they proceed to kind of race to see who can become the viable form of air travel for the next 40 years uh the wright brothers and and other airplane uh aviators also have a lot of crashing a lot more people die there though uh, airplanes had a lot higher body count. Airplanes had a pretty Sorry, big body a lot count. Higher. So they keep going back and forth with the airships being like, "No, we're the we're the safe ones," and or no, the airships being like, "We're the safe ones." Look, this is this is no, flying in luxury. It crashes slowly. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> survivable <laughs> crashes. All right. Sorry, even today, airplane crashes are not very survivable. New, but. Yeah, like I said, it's kind of having this slow but steady rise as they're working out the kinks. And then World War One, the Great War. Yeah. Uh, all of a sudden, I think the Army had ordered like four or five Zeppelins. All of a sudden, they need dozens. Right? And all of a sudden, you've got the full weight and everybody looking at Zeppelin saying, you know, create... This and he is all for it, right? This was his dream from the beginning, right? The Kaiser wants them mostly for um, uh, surveillance, but Zeppelin is like, we must bomb them, <laughs> right? This is what he's been going for for 20 years. It took him 20 years uh, of, like I said, almost pure failure, uh, somehow just failing upward all the time until finally. Uh, he has this chance, and he says, no, we can we can bomb Britain from the skies. Kaiser actually waits on it, because the, the Kaiser was actually cousins with the British king, right? This was still at the beginning of World War I, where you had, like, the, the people coming out of the trenches to play soccer during the, uh, the Christmas miracle or whatever, and things like that, when it was still nice and didn't get to be absolutely horrifying. And Zeppelin kind of helped make it more horrifying because, sure enough, yes. they come and they start dropping bombs on Britain. And here you have the propaganda machines of both countries with the same goal, right? Kind of like what happened with Poland in World War II, right? The Nazis took over Poland and uh, the Polish, or sorry, the, the Allies wanted to show that the Nazis were scary. And so they say that Poland was, you know, conquered overnight. We need to take this Nazi threat. 
seriously. And the Nazis were saying, we conquered Poland overnight, and this is how mighty we are. So they're like both agreeing on this lie. Much Poland actually did an amazing resistance job. It was just buried by both sides. Um, but yeah, we kind of have the same thing with Zeppelins, where you have the Germans saying, these are mighty, terrible war machines. And you have the British saying, these are terrible war machines. They called them baby killers. Right? <clears throat> uh, oh. And we're using it to drive public sentiment against the Germans. Right? Because they were dropping these down. Imagine being on the balloon when it releases the bomb. Because the, the balloon would get lighter and it would shoot up. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, let um. me make that more terrifying for you. Okay? Because... Yes, imagine being on a balloon, you drop the, and the balloon goes up. What if you weren't actually on the balloon, Cody? What if you were just dangling by a rope hundreds of feet below the Zeppelin? Like, like walking on the ground, or? <laughs> Let me tell you a story. <laughs> the bomb's coming. Oh, no. Uh, <laughs> so the British, to answer this, uh... This great Zeppelin threat come up with incendiary ammunition, okay? Because uh, Churchill was like, Psh, they're just big gas bags. They actually called them just big floating gas bags. We'll just shoot them down. So they sent planes up, shot them. Nothing happened. Uh, they could take regular fire uh, and you know, had mounted machine guns where they is, just shoot down the planes. This is something I discovered in my own testing, like, if you have a balloon that's not under pressure, if it's just a, a sack, you can put a lot of bullet holes in it, and it just sits there and floats. It takes a long time for the gas to leak out. <laughs> Boom! Because of that. Guys, we have a dream team here today. I am so dang excited about this. Uh, yeah, well, we have the history, the technical, the actual experience. I, I, I just want to pause and say I am loving this so much. I think I do have uh, a few videos where I was trying to shoot down a balloon. Where you were trying to shoot down the balloon? Yeah. Okay. A long time ago. Helium balloon or hydrogen balloon? Hydrogen. Oh, wow. That's very exciting. I think what I did a few times was uh, the balloon, just a big plastic bag, and I tied some paper to it. Lit the paper on fire, let the balloon go, and I shot at it a few times. Didn't do anything, but once the paper burned, then it, you know, caught nice. fire. Nice. <laughs> but yes, the, the British come up with incendiary ammo that will go That's in the and then go. explode and so all of a sudden you're having zeppelin shot down which is no good then the germans again led by zeppelin come up with high altitude zeppelins yes yes so high that they can go above the cloud cover and drop not drop but lower an observer <laughs> In a little, uh, I'm going to call it a basket. It, <laughs> you are correct. It was called, okay, I know this. It was called the spy basket. Yes, the spy basket. They lower somebody on a spy basket below the cloud cover with a telephone to say, now, drop the bombs now. <laughs> but the bombs are like. What did they do about him, like, going next to him? Uh, they just, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm assuming it was a dangerous job. Uh, but, yeah, that you brought up a very good point earlier. It's like, also, you're there in your little spy basket saying, okay, go. But they're also about to drop, I don't know, what, 20, 30 tons of ballast? Uh, so, yes, I'm you know assuming. No, because you get yanked upwards. <laughs> yeah, so this guy's going to have bombs raining down on both sides of him while the sky yanks him towards the heavens. Uh, so that must have been fascinating. Yeah. Remember that in World War I, balloons were used a lot because the Western, or the, yeah, the Western Front was primarily an artillery war. And so you would send up balloons and they would spot for artillery. The Zeppelins were were too big, too cumbersome for that. They weren't actually as good a bombers as as the as the airplane bombers, and they could only go over to Britain at night as as sort of stealth bombers. 
or going up so high that their crew actually had altitude sickness and was actively freezing to death, <laughs> there were a lot of downsides <clears throat> to the Zeppelins. But they were these great, big, black, horrifying monsters from the heavens. And that's yeah. what they were good at. They weren't actually that good at bombing. They weren't that good at surveillance. But they were very good at psychological warfare. Scary. 